So the book of Acts is showing us how the gospel spreads and how uh, the church of Jesus Christ begins and, and grows and develops. Uh, most recently we have been seeing how God has worked in the heart and the life of Saul of Tarsus, the man who originally was this leader of the persecution against the church of Christ is arrested by Jesus on the Damascus Road, is converted to Christ, and now is set aside to become the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, and we thought last time of how uh, Saul fled to his hometown of Tarsus, and he will be there for the next 10 years. He's out of the scene, as it were, for the next few chapters of the book of Acts. But that doesn't mean that the church isn't growing and developing. Uh, today we look at the work that Peter was doing. Now a word about Peter. The church of Rome believed that Peter was the original pope of the church. And that every pope that follows is following in the succession of Peter. There is absolutely nothing in scripture that in any way supports that. That's a false idea, but it's one that Rome perpetuates. What we do find here is a Peter who is particularly blessed. Now we know the background of Peter. We know how he denied knowing Jesus. We know of how he felt grief and sorrow at his failure and then how he opened his heart to the Lord on that morning over breakfast. Remember the risen Jesus on the beach with the fish and the barbecue, if you want to put it that way, and how they fellowship together and how Peter was called back into the fellowship of believers and, and summoned by Christ to continue the mission of the gospel. And Peter is doing that. Now up until now, all the apostles had remained together in Jerusalem. But of course, many of the Christians had been dispersed, that diaspora that we speak about. Uh, because of the persecution, they fled Jerusalem and they went to various areas. And in those areas where they went to, they took the gospel and uh, churches were established in those areas. And now... It seems that Peter decides that he's going to go on a teaching mission. He's going to go and visit various of these areas and to encourage and to teach the church there. Jesus, of course, had commissioned the disciples uh, to take the gospel first to Jerusalem and then to Judea and then to Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. And this is the fulfillment of the ends of the earth, this diaspora, this spreading of the church throughout the wider world. And, and Peter seems to have grasped a vision for this. Now, Peter was a Jew through and through, and there were certain uh, things in him that needed to be overcome. He, was, he grew up with a prejudice against the Gentiles. But interestingly, here in these uh, two little miracles that we're going to look at, uh, Peter is ministering to Gentiles. Uh, and we'll pick up some of these things as we look at these verses here today. So Peter has gone out to uh, minister to the needs of these uh, churches. And in doing so, he performs at least two miracles here. And again, a thought about that. Is Peter particularly gifted as a, as a healer? No, he's not. All the apostles were gifted in this area. It was part of Christ's promise. He told them that they were to go and preach the gospel. Uh, they were to baptize in his name. And that he would give them the ability to perform signs and wonders to authenticate who they were and the truth of the message they delivered. 
Uh, and that's what these miracles are about. They are an authentication of the gospel working in these areas and the word of God, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached by those who preach it. So let's have just the two points this morning. <laughs> Title ways I have thought miracles. As simple as that, miracles. Because these are two miracles that Peter performs. And uh, the first heading is quite simple. God uses Peter to minister in Lydda. He uses Peter to minister in Lydda. So he travels to this city. It's Lydda, it's called in the Greek in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, it's called Lod, L-O-D, Lod. This city is located in the fertile plain of Sharon. And in the Bible, you sometimes hear Christ referred to as the rose of Sharon. Now, this is a fertile area. It's a very highly agricultural area, a very prosperous area. So Peter visits Lydda. Uh, it's a, a city that sat on a very important trade route. It was about 25 miles northwest of Jerusalem. Today, this is Tel Aviv. It's apparently where this miracle happened would have been close to where Tel Aviv airport is today. Now, there was a church established at Lydda. How did that church come about? Well, there's two possibilities. First of all, we know that Philip had traveled to this area after he witnessed to uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, and there he had preached. So it's possible that the church was established through his ministry in the area. Or it's also possible that some of those who had fled the persecution in Jerusalem had established a church there. But however, there is a church in Lydda. In that church, well, in that city, we're not sure if the man was a member of the church or a converted man or not, but in association with this, there was a paralyzed man, a man who... Uh, was unable to walk. His name is Enos. He had been paralyzed for eight years. And that would infer that he had had some accident or some illness that had caused him to be paralyzed. Something like a stroke or some fall or something like that. We can't make many other assumptions about him. Uh, Peter had gone to minister to the saints in Lydda. Uh, and this man is associated with those saints. Whether he was a saint, a converted man or not, we don't know. But he's been bedridden for eight years, paralyzed. Whatever the cause of his paralysis... I'm sure that he was greatly discouraged. If he had been an able body man, able to be up and about and earn his keep and keep his family and so on, now he's bedridden and he's totally dependent on others. To God, it doesn't matter whether a person has been in such a condition for eight hours or eight years or 80 years, God has the power to turn that life around, to take that person out of their miserable condition and to give them a new life. And so Peter comes to Aeneas and he says to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Jesus, meaning the Savior. Christ, meaning 
Messiah, heals you. Arise and make your bed. And obediently he did. Sounds like a bit of a strange command. Arise and make your bed. And immediately he did. I'm sure mums you wished that your children would do that immediately. You tell them to make their beds. They would make their beds. Now the situation here. This making of the bed. You need to understand something of living conditions in those days. They didn't have bedrooms as such in the house the, the beds would have been laid down on the floor at night uh, probably straw mattresses at the best and the family lay on those and in the morning those would all be made up laid aside into the corner or wherever so that the rest of the area would be available for daily living but this man hadn't done that for eight years. He was constantly lying there in the middle of that living area. What a miserable life he must have had. And now for the first time in all those years, he could get up, he could take his bed and pile it with the rest in the corner. And it's seeing that, that this transformation from him lying there constantly in the way of everything all day. He's now able to get up, stack his bed with everybody else's and free up the whole living area for its normal use. What a change this would have been, not only for the man himself, but for the whole family. The blessing that this must have been to them is beyond our comprehension as we don't live in such conditions. Here, grace of God is poured out on this man and on his family. And this healing takes place. It's an amazing miracle. And the news of this miracle spreads throughout the area. Verse 35 tells us that all in Lydda and Sharon saw this man and turned to the Lord. So the news spreads and uh, you know, they'd obviously known about the man. If we find it in our own communities, if someone has a very serious accident, they're paralyzed, everybody knows about it. And you can imagine that if one day suddenly, miraculously, that man is healed, then the news of that will spread about as well. How did that happen? And then it is told that Peter was there, that he prayed for him and that the man was healed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the people hear this and they are amazed and many of them come and put their faith and their trust in the Lord. You can see how the miracle authenticates the gospel that is being preached. It shows the power of Christ to change lives. They turn to the Lord and you know folks that's what is needed in our own land today, we need people to turn to the Lord. No matter what uh, program we see in television or what news you listen to, we see the sinfulness of the society that we live in. And I don't know about you, I can only know about me. There are times when I am totally perplexed. And I realize that the power of God is needed. The grace of God to change lives, to turn people away from the path of evil that they're following. They're paralyzed with sin. They cannot see their paralyzed condition. Only God can change that. And we should be praying for such a change. I've already said that we're not sure whether Aeneas was a believer or not. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how long a person has struggled with some affliction. Jesus Christ can still set them free. Even years down the line. He can deliver anyone from years of sin and corrupted flesh. 
Every one of us who knows the Lord have been crippled by sin. We have all had our sins and deficiencies dealt with by the power of Christ. That's what this world needs today and we pray that soon the Lord would pour out his blessing in this way. God's grace to heal and restore people. God spread the gospel in Lydda. Peter performed this miracle that gave authentication to that gospel that was going around. And this man was healed, many saw it, and they believed and accepted Christ. That grace of God touches men and women. It touches boys and girls. It touches Jews and Gentiles. We would pray for such a touch for our society today. So God uses Peter to minister in Lydda. But then, secondly, God uses Peter to minister in Joppa. Now there's a place, Joppa. Who do you immediately think of when you think of Joppa? Hi, Jonah. He's a guy. Remember how he went down to Joppa to find a ship that would take him in the opposite direction to Nineveh. But of course God had other ideas and although Jonah was able to board the ship, God sent the storm. Jonah was cast into the sea, swallowed by the fish and brought back. He was vomited up on the shore and had to go and serve God in Nineveh. Do you know where Joppa is or what it's known as today? Jaffa. That's the modern day name for what was known as Joppa. Jaffa. Jaffa oranges. <laughs> Not far away from Joppa there was a certain godly woman named Tabitha. Tabitha was her Aramaic name. The Greek equivalent is Dorcas. They both mean gazelle. So if you're called Tabitha or Dorcas, you're actually a gazelle. So you should be winning all the races. Now here, according to verse 36, Tabitha was known as a woman who did good things for her neighbors and fellow believers. She had to be a rich person. She had the means to help people in many ways. She would have made garments for them and other things. Uh, that cost money even though she was gifted and talented in herself. But that's, this is the person she is. She's sharing what she has uh, and she's seeking to help out people, particularly widows in the community of the church. She's a, a believer, we know this. She is referred to as a, a disciple. She is clearly a believer. But we are told quite simply that she got sick and died. They washed her body, they put her in an upper room as they prepared for burial. In that culture and still to this day, it's the same procedure. And the body would be prepared for burial. It would be laid out in a room where friends and neighbors would come and pay their last respects before the body was buried on the very same day. Obviously, the warm climate that they have didn't permit for a body lying uh, too long. So this Tabitha, her body was washed and, and laid out for that opportunity for friends to come and to pay their respects. We learn that news of Peter's miracle in Lydda has come to Joppa. And so when the believers hear it, 
uh, they send messengers uh, to Peter asking him to come. Now there's no specific command or desire made here. There's no request of Peter other than that he come. Uh, it doesn't say come and raise her from the dead. I don't know what the people expected of Peter. But they wanted him to be there. And so they send these messengers. Uh, the journey would have been about 12 miles, which would have taken about three hours on foot. According to verse 39, the moment that he arrived, they took him to the home where Tabitha's body was laid out in the upper room. And there in that upper room, there was a large gathering of widows who all had benefited from Tabitha's charity. They were there with various examples of the clothes that she had provided for them, many of those garments made by her own hands. And she, they showed these things uh, to Peter. She made these. And that verb make is in the imperfect tense. And that means that she was doing this continually right up to the time of her death. She was occupied in providing for others. It was how she spent her life. These ladies had experienced and enjoyed Tabitha's charity. And they were obviously grief-stricken at her loss. Now Peter would have saw not only the material fruit of her ministry, but also noted the great impact that Tabitha had had on these ladies. The early church did its best. We, we saw this earlier on in Jerusalem where there was a dispute because some widows seemed to be getting better treatment than others. Uh, the church did what it could to help, but Tabitha seems to have gone over and above what the church was doing and has had her own particular ministry to the widows. Now, that's a tremendous testimony to her. These widows had been so touched by what she had done that they wanted her back. They didn't want to lose her. Now think about that. These are all widows. They have lost their husbands. But they're not asking for their husbands back. They're asking for Tabitha. Now raising people from the dead is not your normal thing for even the apostles to be doing. Peter, Peter didn't walk around raising the dead. He didn't come there, I'm sure, even with that thought in his mind. It wasn't something that Jesus did a lot. He did it on several occasions, but not every day. But here, the context is this woman was loved by so many. She had been so generous and so helpful. She had had such a powerful ministry that Peter desired that God restore her to them. Can you imagine him doing that for some stingy, cantankerous person who was difficult to live with? But here, the pleading of others receives his sympathy. Now, there are three specific actions that Peter performs here. Firstly, he puts everybody out of the room. Now, this is something that he had saw Jesus do himself. That verb sent them out is the same verb that was used when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He sent them all out of the room. 
And now Peter does that. He puts out the messengers who had brought him. He puts out the widows who were mourning her loss and obviously also the family. There's only himself left alone with God in the room. And so next, Peter kneels down and prays. He knows that he has no power to raise this woman to life. He's completely, utterly dependent upon God to do this. Only God has that power. The Bible makes it very clear that God is the one who gives life. He alone is the one who has the right to take that life away. And he has chosen to take away Tabitha's life. But Peter is praying he would reverse that decision. Next, Peter turns to the dead body and he says, Tabitha, arise. He uses her Aramaic name rather than her Greek name, Dorcas. And if you think about it, the language he uses is, is very similar to the command that Jesus gave to Jairus' daughter. What did he say to her on that occasion? Talitha, arise. Talitha, the name that Kenny and Charlene gave to their little girl. And this other is called Tabitha. Talitha which means an Aramaic little girl. And Peter uses almost the identical construction when he says, Tabitha, arise. And we are told here that immediately she opened her eyes and looked at Peter. And then she sat up. Peter reaches out his hand and he raises her to her feet. And then he calls the saints and the widows and presents her to them alive. And you can imagine that scene of joy and celebration. What about Tabitha? I wonder how she felt. She had been dead. Scriptures tell us that at the moment of death you pass into eternity. You will be sent either to heaven, your reward for knowing the Lord, for believing and trusting in him, or to hell for your rejection of the Lord. Tabitha would have been in heaven. She would have been already experiencing heaven. Do you imagine the Lord coming along to her and tapping her on the shoulder and saying, Tabitha, I've had a change of mind. I want to send you back to the earth. It must have been a hard thing for him to do and for her to hear. We never really think about that, do we? Maybe she said to him, why me? Is there not somebody else you can send? But whatever communication took place, we don't know. Uh, she was submissive to the Lord and the Lord sends her back. And another day she would die again. According to verse 42, this story became known all over Joppa. And again, many believed on the Lord because of what they heard. This is the reason she was sent back. Her return reaped an eternal reward for others. She was robbed of her 
immediate access to her eternal glorified body. But how many others received hope of their eternally glorified bodies because of her sacrifice and commitment. Now we learn something here about the grace of God. Both of these miracles illustrate to us the power of God in being able to transform people and develop people for the glory of his name. In both these cases, there wasn't one thing either person could do to deliver themselves. What they received was solely by the grace of God. The paralyzed man was restored to good health and physical fitness. Tabitha was given back to the church to continue her charity. And all of this was by the grace of God. It is the grace of God that transforms lives, that develops each one of us day by day. On the moment we receive Christ as our Savior, we are not made perfect immediately. But every single day, God is constantly pouring out his grace upon us. And every day, he's shaving off another little bit of the old nature, helping us to become more and more the people he wants us to be. And that applies here even to Peter. Now, I've already said that Peter was a Jew through and through, that he grew up with Uh, an attitude against the Gentiles. But here we find that Peter goes to dwell in the house of one Simon the Tanner. You know what a Tanner is, of course. He's the man that takes the carcass of the dead animal and strips its hide and makes it into leather. A Tanner was considered to be the most unclean of all people by the rabbis. Because of that very fact that day and daily he worked with dead animals. Now Peter met Simon the Tanner. A man who loved the Lord. And this marks a turning point in Peter and his bigoted attitude towards the Gentiles. Here he has been brought into contact not only with a Gentile, but one who is a tanner. And he swallows his prejudice. And he goes to stay in the very house of Simon the tanner. We'll hear more about him later on. So we see God here at work. He's beginning to develop his church. It's now spreading into the regions of the Gentiles. Gentiles are being accepted into the church. Uh, The ministry of the apostles is being authenticated through the work of miracles and signs and wonders. And the church is growing. Not without opposition. We have saw that already. And the wonderful thing is, that the Lord says, this is the way it will continue until the day I return. So in this day in which we live, we we look around, we see so much negativity with regard to the church. We see our numbers dwindle. We see the interest in the things of Christ um, wane. And, well, we can get discouraged. But remember the promise. The gates of hell will not prevail against my church. And they won't. And even though there are times when the church may go into decline in one area, you can be assured that in another area, thousands are being added to the kingdom of God in places like India, for example. So let us put our trust in God to keep on fulfilling his promises. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that You are a God who keeps his promises.
Uh, you are one whom we can trust. And even though, Lord, in our society today we see a turning away, we see a dwindling of the church, we see people within the church who take uh, the truth of the gospel and they twist it to suit other things. Lord, just give us confidence to know that you're still in control, that you are still building your church, and that we are indeed wonderfully blessed to be part of that. Forgive those times when we fail to see the truth of what's really happening. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.